Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Today, we have Aravinda to talk about his recent work about sleepy channels. Let's welcome him. Uh, thanks. thanks, everyone. Uh, those who are physically here and those who are joining us uh, virtually. So I'll be talking about uh, my uh, recent work on sleepy channels. And uh, it was a wonderful collaboration with uh, Lucas, who is a PhD student at U Vienna now. Julio, Pedro, and Mateo, who is also at U Vienna. I guess you guys should be familiar with Julio and Pedro. Um, OK, so the, uh, the agenda for, uh, for today is for me to introduce uh, this work, obviously. And before we go into that, uh, I should uh, probably give a very brief introduction of uh, the payments and uh, cryptocurrencies, which you guys must be uh, very familiar with. So you have these normal transactions that go onto a blockchain, right? And then, um, um, so if there is a if there is a buyer, uh, Alice, and then there is a seller, Bob, and then they have to probably make uh, uh, payments to purchase. Uh, they can do that, right? So normal payments. Now the point is, it gets a bit uh, tricky when uh, when Alice has to make several um, uh, micro payments to Bob at a very high frequency, right? So then that means that Alice has to make these like, you know, prepare these transactions and post it into the blockchain every time, and then uh, based on the limitations of your uh, the currency's throughput, uh, you know there could be delays on how fast these transactions uh, appear on the blockchain and even worse, how fast they get confirmed, right? So the, the uh, approach uh, to, to, to kind of mitigate this problem is what is called payment channels. And the idea of payment channels is to uh, leverage uh, off-chain payments uh, in order to increase the throughput of the number of payments that can be made between users. So the idea is, um, so Alice and Bob, right? So they create what is called like a, like a joint S or like a joint account, if you think uh, in, in an account-based fashion. So it's a joint address uh, between Alice and Bob. And now Alice has to make, uh, uh, as I said before, several high-frequency payments to Bob. Uh, in, in that scenario, what Alice does is Alice prepares a transaction that spends from this joint address to Bob, right? And uh, it's, let's say that it's uh, some, some coins are going here and the rest of the coins are going to Alice, right? So, so let's say the, the total coins in this joint address is like F, some coins go to Bob, and the rest of the coins go back to Alice. Okay, so now, uh, and now what I've described to you is a scenario uh, where Alice is the one consistently making payments to Bob. So it's kind of unidirectional in the way the, uh, the recipient is set. So Bob is always the recipient. And this means, what, what initially, the coins that go into this giant address is done by Alice. Yeah, so Alice gives F coins into this giant address, and then, uh, so at the very initial state, all the F coins belong to Alice. Now in the subsequent payments, the, the state keeps evolving, right? So the state keeps evolving. And uh, at some point in time, Bob is going to be like, okay, I've, I've had enough. And then what happens is Bob signs one of these transactions, right? So note that it's a joint address, meaning that both Alice and Bob have to sign the transaction, but one, one is not enough. So now, when during this is called closing of the channel, and during closing, uh, Bob signs one of the uh, transactions. And if you if you look closely, uh, this transaction happens to be the last payment, right? So in some sense, because the only the last payment, Bob is going to get maximum number of coins from this uh, joint address, right? So any questions? Of how this unidirectional channel works. So if, if you don't have the shared address, I guess so. So Alice sends coins to Bob so like a transaction, and Bob has to post it yeah. uh, in the chain. Yeah. And and the signature comes from who? Alice. Alice. Okay. 
So, I mean, one thing that I probably probably missed here is that, so this is considered a payment, right? So the next one is a payment and so on. And each of these payments is basically Alice preparing the transaction and Alice signing the transaction. Okay, I see. But still it's not valid because Bob is yet to sign it. Okay, then at the end Bob will sign exactly, it. Exactly, exactly. So, so this, what if Bob doesn't close the channel, the status lose all the money? Okay, so good question. So that's why you have a, a, a refund mechanism where if Bob ever refuses to just sign, Alice gets back the funds from the joint address after some reasonable amount of time, right? Mm -hmm. So that's like the refund mechanism. Refund after time T, right? So in, in some sense, what they do is before Alice go, is going to send the coins to the joint address, meaning fund the channel, right? Before that, Alice is going to negotiate kind of a refund transaction with Bob, right? So the refund is going to look something like uh, AB, the joint address, to Alice, all the coins, but this is only valid after time T, right? So this is going to be the transaction that is signed by both Alice and Bob. They, they both sign, right? And Alice has this locally with, uh, with her. And uh, as, as Elaine pointed out, if ever Bob doesn't show up, Alice can just take the funds back, right? Okay, so this is just unidirectional channels. So, sorry, just, just to clarify. So then I guess the idea would be like take all the transactions at once and you post them all at the same time to the chain or? Which, uh, which one? So I'm saying like, so, so I guess the idea is like you have several payments. Right? Yes. And then you take them all at once and you, instead of having like one, Posting one for each. Oh, okay, 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 okay. The crucial thing is none of these payments are posted yet, right? Right. So they're all off chain, uh -huh. right? So an example would be let's say f is equal to 10, right? And the, so f is equal to 10. And the first payment, right? So the first payment, uh, one coin goes to Bob and nine goes to Alice, right? And then the second one is like two to Bob and eight to Alice. So on, yeah? And then Bob doesn't need to post everything. He just needs to post, let's say, they finish at the second payment, Bob just posts this, it's done. So, so what is happening here is that at this point, let's say Alice posts the funding transaction on chain, that has to be on chain after the refund, right? After the refund is set, Alice puts the funding transaction on chain. So this is where the funding goes. Okay, and let's say that you have time t, right? After this point, a refund could go, but before that, at any point in time, you could just close the channel. Mm -hmm. Bob could close the channel, right? So if you observe at the price of two transactions, you get to make whatever number of payments, right? Um, yeah, in a, in, a, in a one direction, right? So to Bob, right? Okay, so now going to bidirectional channels. So the idea behind bidirectional channels is that you have a channel between Alice and Bob, and uh, you want payments to go in both ways, right? So you want payments to go, you know, like one payment probably, you know, goes to Bob, so let's say, let's say it's like one, and then uh, F minus one. But the next payment, right? This is the first one. The next one could be 0.5 to Bob and F minus 0.5 to F. So notice that this will never happen in the unit direction because Bob will never let this happen. But if you if you notice what's happening is Bob is kind of kind of paying back the 0.5 uh, to Alice, right? And this could go further down, whatever number of payments. Um, now the what is what is technically different from unidirection to bidirection is that let's say that they, they made this payment now and they want to go to the second payment, right? So they are at the second payment. If you notice. Uh, this is the valid payment now. The second payment is a valid payment, but the first payment is kind of preferable for Bob, 
right? So Bob could just go and do the first one when the second one is valid, right? So what you what you're missing here is kind of a revocation mechanism. So you want to revoke payments, and uh, in specifically, you want to revoke this payment, right? So you want to revoke this one. Now, the uh, the idea that that you know uh, that is quite popular and also used in this Lightning Network that's deployed for Bitcoin Bitcoin. The idea is is that these payments, right? So these payments are set in such a way that um, okay, so okay, so let me let me probably take this uh, the, the first payment as example and see how we can revoke it. Okay, so these these addresses are set in such a way that to to take coins from this address, right? For Bob to take coins from this address, it has to wait for some delta units, yeah. And what is this delta? So let's let's imagine that this first payment goes on chain at this point. Yeah. Let's call it now for uh, for uh, Bob to spend from this address. Bob has to wait for delta units, right? Uh, before taking the coins from this address. All right. Now it's the same for the other one also. So in some sense, this is also locked for the witness. All right. Okay, so this is how the addresses are set up in each of these payments. And what happens during a revocation, let's say that if uh, the first payment is revoked, so it's going to be revoked. Now what, what the users do uh, is they, they set up a transaction that spends from, uh, let me, this V star. So that spends from V star to some coin of A, right? Some address of A, sorry, some address of A. Right. So this this is a revocation transaction that spends from V star to A. Right. Now the crucial thing is that this V star happens to be also a joint address. So this one is a joint address. Right. So now what happens is the coins go to this AV star, right? Technically, it should go to Bob, but it's going to a joint address. That's fine. That's okay. Now, let's say that there is uh, uh, like, like, you know, they also negotiate a transaction to take the coins from AV star to some address of Bob. Okay. So what do I mean by this? Is like, let's call this like finish. What this does is it takes the ABSR and it takes it to B. So in addition to this, they have like these two transactions, right? Now, the, the point is that this, this transaction can be posted only after delta units. While this transaction, you can set the script in such a way that this transaction can spend from AB star immediately. I guess I, I'm confused. Like, so let's say if we have Ethereum as smart contract, we did we need to do all of this. Like in that case, I mean, in an account, it, like a uh, like in an account based setting, this you don't encounter these problems. So the main challenge is how to do it on top of Bitcoin yeah. without using that's the exactly without using any smart contracts. I, I see. So what about these like? Uh, uh, what is the payment channel projects? Are they actually being traction in practice? Like, is, has there been any killer application of these projects? I mean, it's uh, like they are getting, uh, for example, Lightning Network, which is uh -huh. like the largest network of payment channels right now, is is, is and they are getting nodes by by the day. So the sure, capacity of uh, like this is for like repeated payment scenario, right? Yeah. Like, do they understand what what kind of uh, usage? Uh, no, so it's. Like, uh, so I think it is just for uh, like you know pay, paying for online services. Uh, you know, uh, if I'm using like I don't know uh, the, the motivating example that I would start is something like if you're using some video streaming service and then you want to pay the guy for a minute and then you want to 
use cryptocurrency. Yeah, this is what we do. And to answer your question about they getting popular, I think recently there were some proposals that uh, that you know kind of uh, generalized this. I mean, there are several protocols that generalize a payment channel, like like a network of payment channels. And then some of them are actually. Uh, so I know that some people are interested in implementing it. Uh, so the, the like this video application is that the main usage and today or is I, that just like an envision scenario? I think that was like the envision scenario. Uh, right? So what is the main usage today? Like for what type of users? I I'm not too familiar with what what users do in Lightning. Networks like why, why do they use lightning networks? I, not, I don't mm -hmm. know the details, so I see. But I mean, uh, like every month that I go and I check like the capacity and like number of nodes that are involved in this lightning network, and it's like growing. Well, the question is whether that's like, um, like speculators are hype or whether that's any real usage. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's it'll be probably good to check. Like yeah. really bad, bad this payment challenges and stuff like that. I mean, I think the 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 one thing is like uh, uh, probably the since it's like you know it uses very less scripts and then we we don't have too many on chain costs. So compared to probably that uses like some complex scripts, conditional scripts, and so on. So maybe uh, it's attractive to use. No, I understand the promise. I just like wonder if like the blockchain application space has advanced to a stage where we need this kind of capability we are. You know, uh, so often I ask, okay, what's the killer application for blockchain? And we don't have very many right, in general. I mean, you, so you're saying, I would say that the blockchain space probably, if it has enough, like, you know, if it can handle like multitudes of transactions, they won't need this. Uh, but since they can't, uh, probably they, the payment channel is coming to handle those situations. Uh -huh. uh, I mean, it's it not, it's, I, I know that, like, uh, so I think uh, in Lightning, maybe I'm, I'm wrong, so I should say something wrong here. So in Lightning, I know that there are some nodes that just offer these payment services. So they, they sit, stand in the middle and they say, you know, open a channel with me, open a channel with me, and then I will route your payments. So they offer these services, may not be micro payments, but they they just offer for payments. And, yeah, uh, I'm just curious to see, like, are they uh, do they have like you know vendors and merchants that they provide service for? I, I think probably they do. Uh, uh -huh. uh, yeah. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. So what about applications for bidirectional channels? Like video service seems. Uh, yeah, so bi-directional channel, I think the same idea of uh, like, uh, um, like so you, you so the point is, um, I think the, the, the time limit, the timeout that I mentioned here, uh, that's not actually how it's implemented in Lightning, right? So there is no timeout. So you can have a channel with someone, it's fine. And then maybe you don't make micro payments, but Maybe you know that you're going to make some kind of a click on payment with the guy, and you know sometimes uh, sometimes you know you want to take back the payment. Sometimes you want to continue with the payment. Maybe you hold it for a year. Several times you make it. Several times he refunds you. So in those scenarios, you would need a buy direct channel. Yeah. 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 Question. Yeah. So for the unilateral uh, settings, so this this is interesting only if there is no smart contract. Yeah, I mean, uh, so uh, uh, yeah. So in this setting, how how do we guarantee that the values can get can get refound if there is no smart contract? So that's why they have this transaction negotiated, right? So they have the refund transaction. So it's just a normal transaction. It spends from an address to an address. No smart contracts. But who initiated that transaction? So it's so okay. Before Alice opens the channel, yeah, right. So Alice and Bob. Negotiate this transaction together. Okay. Right. So they can do that because they know AB, right? And they can create a transaction even though this address is not yet on the chain. Right. They can do this transaction. They can keep it locally and then deal with the paper. But I mean, this is this is for understanding. So in Lightning, it, it is slightly different for the 
wait for the mechanism, but this is the gist of it. Right. So at a high level, like like let's say I don't want for a smart contract because maybe you know it's harder to uh, to do parallel parallelization or maybe it's more more overhead to execute for a smart contract. I, I just want to have payment channel on top of Bitcoin. But in that case, another approach is just to um, enhance the Bitcoin script with some additional minimal trusted functionality, right? Sorry. That then you can do a lot of these things. Yeah. Much more easily and in the architectural architecture of much cleaner that, that, that that's true. That's true. So I mean, of course, uh, if if the scripting capability of Bitcoin is enhanced, probably uh, you won't do this. But again, if if uh, I mean, I I haven't yet motivated why I'm doing this. Uh, why we did this work. So one of our uh, goals was to not use any scripts from the chain, mm -hmm. even when they are available. We don't want to use them. And this is for reducing the, the costs of on-chain verification and size of the transaction and like what is called this fungibility of transactions, right? So we, 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 we want our, one of our goals is to make these transactions look like any other regular transaction on the network and nothing special to uh, the coins involved. And I think the cryptocurrency space, like they, they value this fungibility concept. So, I mean, I'll, I'll go into that motivation now. Uh -huh. so. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, I will probably answer a few of your questions uh, in the next step. Uh, okay, so so the idea of the revoke is that the revoke transaction can go immediately, while the finished transaction has to wait for a delta unit, right? So now you can see that if Bob posts this, okay, so what do they do in the revoke time, right? So what, what they do in the revoke is basically sign this transaction. But both of them sign the transaction, right? So now the point is, if ever Bob posts the first payment, since they have already revoked, right? Alice can immediately post this, right? And, and, and there is no race condition between the revoke and the finish because the finish can be uh, put on chain only after 10 times, right? So essentially, if I, if I want to, so this, is, this even holds if, if Bob is trying to do this, yeah. So notice that now, I mean, they of course have a revoke for even this one, but this is not signed yet because this payment is not revoked, right? But they have a finish, right? So they probably also signed this finish. Now, the, the, when Bob is trying to put this valid payment on chain, yes, Bob still has to wait delta units, but Bob will get its money with the finish. Alice can't do, Alice can't put the revoke because the payment is not revoked. Okay. All right. So now, okay. So this is where we stand. And the, the slight modification of the, I mean, the, the, the uh, refund is what Lightning uses right now. Uh, it's one of the most like prominent applications. I think the number of payments that go through Lightning has gone up every year. So, um, and. Sorry, uh, can I ask a question? What does Lightning mean, though? So uh, Lightning Network, I think it's like a, it's like a, a, like a, like a company where they offer uh, payment routing services. So it's like um, it, they, they have, so you can also go there. I think you can post notes where you are like the intermediary here and um, uh, you, you, you open a channel with this guy and this guy has a channel with someone else, right? So now you can route your payments to this lightning network, to this guy, without having to make any of the uh, uh, transactions to go on chain. Okay. So this is like a, like a generalization of this payment channel and federation channel. So that's what lightning does. Okay. So they host nodes where um, they help route payments and everything remains off chain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Okay, perfect. So, um, sorry, yeah. one more question about the revoke. Yeah. So, I, I'm a little bit confused. What's the order of the first uh, of posting the first transaction on chain and the revoke and the finish of the first transaction and this post okay. the second transaction? Okay, so let me put some numbers. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So, this is the first one. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So, now uh, this is also something like, like, okay, let's take this as a right. Okay, so that's two. 
And then this is three. They go okay. to the next payment. Mm -hmm. And uh, then they revoke this one. I see. Right? So they revoke that one. And then this is five. Uh, probably uh, it's, it's oh. probably it's five on this is four. So, so like they can be the, the order of these two. These two probably switches. So the idea is that uh, uh, just after you have made a new payment, you have two valid payments, mm -hmm. but this is kind of accepted. This is, you can't get rid of this because you, for example, if before you make this payment, if you revoke this one, then you are in trouble because there is no valid payment now. So yeah, so, yeah. yeah. that makes sense. Thank yeah. you. Okay. so. Um, okay, so now uh, if you look at this proposal, right? So uh, um, it seems like all you need is like signatures on transactions and uh, pretty much it. Um, now the, the crucial thing is that you you want this you want this what is called this relative time lock, right? So it's not like an absolute number, like like you, it's not like when you say you say that like tomorrow at 5 p.m. No, it's not. So it's more like, it's like three hours after you post the transaction, right? So it's a relative time lock. And um, that that's probably, that's we zone into that and we have some problems there. So the, the, the one of the main problems is that uh, you need this relative time lock script from the, from the chain, right? Uh, and um, what it means is that it requires Alice to be online always, like it, it, Alice has to be persistently online throughout the lifetime of the channel, right? And and recall that I said in, in Lightning Network they actually don't have this timed refund; they have a different mechanism, right? So in that case, Alice probably either she closes the channel or just waits, right? And just waiting to see if Bob is ever misbehaving because Alice just has this delta unit to punish. And she doesn't know when Bob is going to cheat, right? So she doesn't know that, and therefore she has to constantly stay online and monitor the blockchain to see if ever a revoke payment goes on, right? So that's one. That's one issue. The second issue is uh, if you take uh, if you take these currencies like Monero, which is like the privacy preserving version. Now they don't have this uh, this relative time lock script. Right? So they don't even have the time lock script. So they don't have relative time lock and it's, a, it's actually a problem for them to have the relative time lock and it's not, it's not uh, uh, easy to extend their scripting capability into this relative time lock because then you, you kind of know, learn information about which key has a relative time lock and then if the key spends within the short time, you know that this key is spending and this causes some privacy problems for Monero and it's not straightforward to see how those script will go to include this uh, little time lock in Monero. All right, so um, perfect. So now the, the problem I said was that Alice persistently has to stay online and check whether Bob is cheating or not. And uh, to, to, to kind of circumvent this problem, uh, you have these proposals called uh, watchtowers, right? Um, I mean, the, the, the basic idea is that you just outsource the monitoring aspect to some third party, uh, ensuring that the third you you uh, you kind of enforce some form of or some form of accountability on this third party, right? So, um, for example, in that case, Alice hires a third party called the Watchtower, and then uh, there are some accountability measures to ensure that you know the Watchtower will do its work. Uh, whenever Bob cheats, and it will punish on behalf of uh, Alice. Now there are a series of these Watchtower proposals, and some of them even try to like you know start their own firm. Um, the one of the uh, the popular ones was Pisa, which was actually tailored for Ethereum. Um, but uh, okay, so these these Watchtower proposals have uh, have different issues among them, and uh, one of the one of the the, the, the giveaway is that Alice has to give some information about her channel and her payments to a third party and has to trust the third party with that information. So inherently there is a, there's a privacy leak here. And uh, 
different proposals have different drawbacks. For example, uh, PISA, which is the, uh, the helium-based, uh, smart contract-based watchtower proposal, that they actually require the watchtower to lock some collateral value to enforce this accountability. So what happens is that if the watchtower goes offline, or if the watchtower just colludes with Bob and doesn't behave honestly, then the collateral that the watchtower locked goes to the you know the hiring party, which is Alice and Alice. So and this collateral amount happened to be like the, the same as the channel capacity, right? Meaning uh, it, it had to be uh, because you so it had to be F, right? Because uh, in the worst case, if the watchtower misbehaves, in the worst case, Alice would lose F coins, and Alice has to be compensated this F coins, and that would come from the watchtower. So the watchtower has to lock this collateral through the duration of the time that it's being hired. And everything is fine, gets it, gets it back, but it still has to lock this coin. And uh, the idea was to have this watchtower as a service for all uh, parties interested in having channels. So that means the watchtower has to lock the collateral for each and every channel. And uh, it seems to be not financially viable uh, for the amount of fee that it would get. Right? So it had to lock a lot of collateral, uh, even if it is behaving honestly. Uh, um, and it would get some here and there. So it, it, so these these were the issues with watchtowers. So our our uh, I'm now ready to complete my title. So now the idea is to have a uh, a Bitcoin uh, compatible bidirectional channel uh, without watchtowers. So you don't want to uh, rely on a, a third party and you, you don't want to use any complex scripts and you, because that is important for the universality of the, uh, the, the mechanism, because there are some chains apart from, as I told you, Monero doesn't have uh, the scripting capability and it's not clear how to extend that also. So you want to, you know, have like, for example, a bi-directional payment channel for Monero, right? So uh, yeah, so that is the, that is the motivation. Now, uh, okay, so to, okay. so now uh, to, uh, to see where the trouble comes from is, is basically this, this relative time lock and we want to get rid of that. We want to see if we can get rid of this time lock. So now let's say that it's actually not a relative time lock, but an absolute time lock, right? So the, the first approach Would be to replace this relative to some absolute value t, right? So what what does this mean? This means that when, when okay, so it, that's clear in this case. But what happens in a valid payment scenario? So recall that I said in a valid payment scenario, even then Bob has to wait for this delta image, even for a valid payment. But now, if if you replace this relative time lock to an absolute time lock. It is clear in this case what would happen because Alice can just go offline and just come slightly before T and notice, see the chain if there are some misbehavior and can, it, it has the window to still function. That's the idea of an absolute time lock. But in this scenario, Bob is behaving honestly, right? Bob puts this statement, but Bob itself has to wait for some time T. That would that would be you know something like a you know a large window, something like. I don't know, like a few weeks or something. Um, and then it has to wait till that time to get his honestly earned money, right? So the, the trouble is you just can't leave this time to uh, just put an absolute time lock and it's, it's over, it's, it doesn't work like that, right? So to circumvent this, uh, one, uh, one idea would be to let if if Bob is indeed behaving honestly, right? If Bob is indeed behaving honestly, uh, you give a way for Bob to take uh, the money before the absolute time lock, right? Um, okay. So the uh, uh, the idea probably I'll kind of move faster towards the protocol. Okay. So. Okay, 
So the uh, the the idea is the following. So now you have uh, you have this A B, which is the channel, and it has this uh, F cut right? Okay. So what you can do is you want to incentivize uh, somehow uh, for for Bob to behave honestly and also Alice to behave honestly, so that the money can be taken out from the channel if one of them wishes to do so. Right. So how do how do we do this? Is we have additionally a collateral C, which is for example, uh, let's say uh, locked by Bob for uh, uh, yeah, so locked by Bob. And uh, now what happens is that you you are going to spend from this channel now. Okay. So the the first one uh, goes to uh, uh, goes to let's say Alice. And uh, now you are going to have a, uh, a time of T on this uh, address, right? So whatever some X, A points go to Alice, that is a time of T. And uh, if it is a revoked payment, right? If it is a revoked payment, uh, Bob uh, has, to, has to have a mechanism to punish this. So you, you, all, you also have, a punish branch here, right? Where uh, the coins would go to Bob, so in, in its entirety. So that's like the punish branch. Um, and now, uh, what we want to say is that you have another joint address, which is like uh, which we call the sleepy channel. So this sleepy channel. Uh, gets the uh, gets the collateral from on that so uh, Bob. So the idea is that since Bob locks a collateral here, right, and then Alice tries to close the channel, right. We want to somehow incentivize Bob to take its money out because it is also locking a large amount in this channel. So we want to incentivize Bob to take this coins out. And the minute Bob does so, Alice can immediately take her coins from the channel and she doesn't have to wait till time t. Any questions? Okay, so, um, all right. So, I mean, uh, if, you, if you look at it, you also have the symmetric case, right? So you 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 also have the case where it would be Bob trying to post first and then so on and so forth. So uh, that means that Alice would also be locking some collateral state, right? So the other half. So this would mean that uh, there's like XA plus C uh, from the end of Alice also. Now, now the, 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 the crucial observation is that what we are trying to say is that uh, for Bob to take its money out, the minute it does so, Alice can take its, its coins out, right? That's what we want to say. And it is possible that the Bob's balance, which is XB, could be zero, right? So if it is zero, then Bob has no incentive. That's why we have this collateral C to push its, uh, you know, uh, to kind of encourage it a bit more. So now when you have the C, Bob you know, has considerable amount of money locked and then when Bob realizes that, okay, Alice is going to close, Bob also wants to take the money out. So it's going to take this XB plus C out and then that would mean that A can take its coin out. Now the, the, ask, the one, one, one other uh, aspect here is that Alice has no reason to keep its C locked, right? Because Alice is the one trying to close. Alice is the one trying to close, and Alice has no reason to keep the collateral locked. So Alice, once it uh, attempts to close the channel, can immediately take the collateral. So it can immediately take its collateral, and what's still locked is this XA coins, right? Which is pending kind of an uh, approval from Bob, right? So what do I mean by approval? So this C coins, so first C, so this C coins immediately go to Alice. 
Alice can take it to give it to Alice still has this X A coins bar. Now, if Bob, so if this was a revoked payment, Bob has this time T to punish, which is an absolute time lock time. And if it doesn't want to punish, then a Bob uh, has this considerable amount of money locked here. And what we say that, you know, from this, from this channel, if uh, uh, Bob wants to take out through some transaction, right? So if, if it wants to take out some coins, now what we say is that this transaction happens to create some kind of a, some kind of an enabling address. You can think of it like, like that. So it's an enabling address. What, what this enables is then for Alice to take the coins out from this address. Right, so Alice can use a transaction that spends from this, uh, you know, this XA clients and this enabler address, and it takes to some address of us. Now, to see why this works is because if Bob decides to take the money fast, it would end up creating this enabler address, and with this enabler address. Alice can you know, use this enabler address to take its coins immediately out. So that's how we enable that if Bob takes its money out quickly, Alice can immediately take its money. It need not wait for time. Right? So um, otherwise, if, if Bob is, is fine to kind of, I don't know, for some reason punish, then Alice waits for time three and takes it out. Right? So this, this is kind of an incentive for Bob to kind of cooperate if if Alice is trying to close this channel, right? Is, is it any, any questions? I probably jumped a few steps for it. Was it clear? So question, uh, so you, you mentioned that the previous solutions uh, didn't work as well because the uh, involved party is need, uh, had to have a lot of collateral on the table. Yeah. Uh, but. Uh, so, so is yeah, that okay. the same here? Good, 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 good question. Good question. So, okay. So, this is actually F plus C plus C, right? So, because both parties are not in collateral. Anyway, so this collateral C is is something that is negotiated between Alice and Bob, and it's not dictated by the protocol. But in the other scenario, uh, the watchtower had to lock the collateral C, which was equal to F. Right. So, but here the collateral amount C is something that is negotiated between Alice and Bob. Right. I mean, let's say that they are they are frequent channel owners or something. In that case, they could have a low collateral. And if let's say that they they don't know each other and probably the guy cheats. And in that scenario, you would say the, the collateral amount would be the same as F. So this this C is kind of a you know you can, you can tune the C from zero to F, and that completely de uh, is uh, uh, dependent on the trust levels between Alice and Bob. But in the other watchtower proposal, uh, you had to have the watchtower uh, lock the collateral. I also thought that the problem was that you had like the watchtower would have to lock like many collaterals, right? Yeah, exactly. So, like... so if, if, for example, if I'm opening a channel with some trusted people, I don't, I don't need to open, uh, have a collateral. But in that case, you don't even need the watchtower to begin with. Uh, because if you trust, the other person, then you even Alice doesn't need to persistently monitor the chain, right? Fair enough, fair enough. Uh, but okay, probably the extreme case probably is a pretty much probably you take some intermediate case where well, this makes sense. Um, yeah, so that now, now to just to just to see what we actually did, we didn't require any relative panel up. We didn't require that. We just had an absolute time lock and had a mechanism, like like wired a mechanism for an honest Alice not to wait for time t, uh, but rather have a fast mechanism to take the coins out. And, uh, and that is by making Bob lock uh, its balance and some collateral in what we call the sleepy channel. So uh, yeah, that's that's the that's the thing. And now the point is. Um, I, I, one of our extended goals was to not use uh, even the absolute time lock, right? So we all we wanted to do was just 
transaction and transaction signature verification. Right? So all we wanted from the chain was signatures because then your trans your all these transactions look like a normal transaction that happens in the chain. So that's like like the like good fungibility for your protocol. And uh, the idea there was to uh, replace this this absolute time of t with uh, our um, with with a tool called verifiable time signatures. So th that's a that's an idea where you can actually embed a signature inside a time commitment in a verifiable manner. And then the other party has to kind of open this commitment and learn the signature. So you can, you can see that that would work because it's possible that uh, the transaction that would spend from here that is being time locked, right? Uh, the signature on that transaction could be embedded inside this time commitment and given to the other party. I mean, the other party has a transaction, but it, it also only has the commitment, not a valid signature. Yet. So it has to compute till time p to obtain the signature and make the transaction valid. Right. So in that sense, we can actually uh, realize this absolute time locks uh, using verifiable time signatures, where you can actually time a payment for the future without using any scripts. And um, that actually enables us to kind of go go universal with this uh, idea. So you have uh, very this this time signatures. For example, for Monero, and then uh, you use that, and then since you don't need a relative time lock, you get you for the first time you get a bidirectional payment channel for a privacy currency like Monero. So, yeah, the, the the whole motivation behind this was to 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 not require this online assumption and eventually move towards some kind of a universality. Like like this protocol has to work with all currencies irrespective of. Whether they give smart contracts or scripts or something, all we require is a signature. That's it. Yeah. So, uh, any any questions? So you mentioned that there is a time commitment to a signature. Yeah. Uh, you need some guarantees on this commitment being well formed and it actually. Yeah, yeah. So you have this. So you have this this notion called verifiable time signatures. So uh, I had a paper on this like a. Uh, Year back, where we actually give efficient constructions for uh, Schnorr, ECDSA, DLS. Uh, in, in, so, what happens is that the committer gives a commitment, and the verifier is convinced that the commitment is well formed, it can be solved in time t, and once it's solved, it obtains a valid signature. So, all these. But then, doesn't this break the hiding property of the commitment that uh, I mean? No, you won't. It's uh, it's kind. Of, you can think of it like a like a is it proof attached to the commitment. So the proof itself won't leak any information. Right, right. It. But that's a that's that requires proof, right? So, yeah, yeah. The, yeah. So so your your construction also requires an ASIC proof, like the verifier. We we yeah oh, okay yeah we we we, uh, we actually develop like a we actually write down the ASIC proof. So oh, okay. It's not that, like just that a makes sense. Embedded ASIC proof actually write down. So. Yeah, I mean, you get you have efficient construction for now, ECSA, BLS, and also for uh, the transaction stream of Monero. And so now, when you use these things, you can realize time payments in in currencies that use e signatures, and that's what you need for this one. And uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, questions. I guess just question like what, what kind of computational assumptions do you need to negotiate this? Uh, and we actually work on any signature. So as long as you have a as long as you have a working currency that has a uh, I, I think I think we need strongly affordable okay. Uh, let me just say strongly affordable signature scheme. Okay. Uh, that's that's good enough. You also need this right on top of that. So, uh, when you use a when you replace these timeouts by time commitments, okay. uh, yeah, you you then uh, when you instantiate that for like signature schemes, then you require a long. Yeah. I mean, the, yeah, I guess my question is also like how you compare like. Are, are you, I guess the assumptions you use are not much stronger than what you need for like these bidirectional channels. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
I mean, okay, so assumptions for, I mean, like from a, okay. I mean, for, for us, like we just like what I had in mind was like we assumed that the currency gives a signature. So that was our assumption in, 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 in our sense. So I get what, what yeah. mm -hmm. So we don't make any extra assumptions apart from the like the state of the art. Yeah, and I think the paper is out. Uh, I think the paper came out today, so feel free to. Yeah, any, I mean, any, if you have any questions, discussion, you can take it offline. There are no questions. Thank you.